Um, I'm Christy Wyckoff. I'm the I'm the deputy director of the Conservancy, um, and right now I'm I'm also the interim executive director while we work on um, hiring a new ED. So. Um, if anyone knows any excellent candidates, we are in the process and we have a search firm doing the work. So I'm just gonna throw that little plug out there. More information on our website. Uh, this is our second virtual, what we would call Hacienda talk, which are our traditional um, guest speakers and speaker and, and presentations by the Conservancy um, that we used to host in the Hacienda. Um, but now we have, we're able to increase our reach and, uh, and do them virtually, um, as so much of our lives are virtual these days. Um, today we have Mike Stake, who is a dear friend of mine and the Conservancy. He's been working um, with the Conservancy. Mike, I forgot to ask, but I think you've been working with the Conservancy since 2010, is that correct? 2009. 2009, when you started at Ventana, okay. So he's, a sen he's the senior wildlife biologist at Ventana Wildlife Society um, and started there in 2009, um, where he apparently was also introduced to the preserve landscape that same year. Um, he's an exceptional birder. Uh, I aspire to have one smidgen of the skills that he has, much of which he has taught me over the years that we've been working together in the field. Um, he helps the Conservancy with our annual raptor surveys and our annual grassland, sur uh, grassland bird surveys. Um, he also is highly involved in the condor work that Ventana Wildlife Society is really focused most of their work on in recent years um, and has given the conservancy we've we've been able to go out on tours with him on the coast to see condors um, and it's just been such a, a treat to have such a good friend and excellent biologist as a colleague um, and so we thought it'd be fun for him to share with you what he's you know uh, what, what we know about condors in particular um, recently he worked on a report for the conservancy to understand how condors may be using the preserve. Um, so I assume he'll be bringing some of that information in. Um, so with that teaser, I'll let Mike carry away. Thank you, Christy. It, it, it is a treat to be connected with you this afternoon. Uh, it's the next best thing to actually being there. And some of you, uh, I've met some of you and, and others have maybe seen me out on the preserve with rubber boots and binoculars looking for birds. And I always appreciate how the staff and the residents are always very accommodating. So thank you and thank you for allowing me to spend a little awesome. time with you. Uh, your, your microphones are uh, muted. Uh, but that doesn't mean that I don't want to hear from you. Uh, there are a couple of ways you can interact. One is we'll have time for some questions at the end and, and we can uh, unmute everyone. Uh, but you also feel free to uh, post some comments in the chat uh, section of Zoom. Uh, if you find uh, the chat button, I think it's on the bottom of your screen and feel free to type in anything, a, a question that you might have. And, and maybe if, if Christy or Lindsay would be able to monitor those, uh, feel free to stop me during the presentation. I might get to those questions at some point anyway, but sometimes I think that the best time to answer a question is when they first come up. And so feel free to post your questions. I'd like to tell the condor story and there, there are three main things that I want to weave into this story and the first is how important the central coast is to the condor story from beginning to now and to the end. Second, I want to talk about Santa Lucia Preserve's role in that recovery. What is your likelihood of seeing condors on the preserve? Have you seen condors on the preserve? We'll talk about that and how the preserve can fit into future recovery for the condor. And then the third part of this story is 
the greatest threat to condor populations, and that is lead poisoning. And I want to talk about what Ventana Wildlife Society is doing to reduce lead exposure for California condors. To start, I asked you to start and you didn't start. Start when? The, the talk. Oh. I'd, like to, uh, I'd like to present three different historical observations that I think help tell the condor story. And the first one is back in 1602. And it's right here in Monterey County, a Spanish explorer, uh, let me see if I get this right, uh, Father Antonio de la Ascension observed condors scavenging a whale that had washed up on the beach. And this was the first documented observation of California condors right here in Monterey County. That's not to say that other people didn't observe condors before that. Certainly Native Americans saw condors earlier than that, and they may have recorded them some way that I'm not aware of. The point I wanna make here is that condors are a, as a part of the central coast as you and I. They were here for a long time. And so the central coast is very important for their recovery. Jump ahead 200 years and we have Lewis and Clark. They called the condor the vulture of the Columbia. They actually measured one and found it was uh, nine to 10 feet. Uh, nine and a half feet is about the maximum wingspan for a California condor. The Columbia, I guess, refers to the Columbia Gorge where they were exploring in the Pacific Northwest. And they write in their notebook, uh, we have seen it feeding on the remains of the whale and other fish which have been thrown up by the waves on the seacoast. And like any good naturalist, they provide a sketch of the condor, very lifelike, and a very generous compliment. This is a handsome bird at, at a little distance. They had to add in that at a little distance, I'm afraid. I think maybe we see a little bit of their humor uh, in this observation, but even back in 1805, 1806, they're essentially putting boundaries on how much we should enjoy condors. You know, I'm not sure what your feeling is, but I know a lot of people, they, they think of condors as being, well, okay, they, they do their thing, but just don't get too close to them. Well, many people do think that it is a, a very handsome bird. And I take visitors down the central coast and when we see condors, sometimes just within 30 feet over our heads, just zooming by and you can hear the wind through their wings like a, like a flag and really, it's an incredible sight, and people have told me that it is a very beautiful sight. And then another observation, 30 years later, John Townsend. There's a, there's a species of bird on the Santa Lucia Preserve named after Townsend, at least one. So he was rather important in early ornithology. Here he expresses his inexpressible joy at watching the great Californian, as he calls the bird. He describes it, down like an arrow he plunged. The bird here had its sights on a salmon that had been cast. At that moment, John Townsend fires his gun. If you're having trouble reconciling the inexpressible joy with firing a gun and killing the bird, then you're not alone. It's just a, a different time back in those days, in the 1800s. It was an age of curiosity where they didn't have binoculars. And so sometimes the best way to get a good look and to study something scientifically 
was just to shoot the bird. And that was unfortunate. That started a decline in the species that, last, that lasted until modern times. Not too long after 1835, we have the gold rush years and, and someone got the uh, brilliant idea of taking a condor feather like the one I'm holding here. And they found that if you just snip off the end of that, it's nice and hollow. You can pour your gold dust inside and, and hang it around your neck and you make a great wallet. And that became a, a bit fashionable in those days and people wanted condor feathers. And so uh, I don't know how many condors were shot in the 1800s, but enough to cause declines in the species. If I were to give you a fourth historical observation, it might be the one that never took place. I was in sixth grade back in 1980, and I had saved up for my first golden guide to birds of North America. And I was excited to see the picture of the California condor because there was a little dot on its range map saying that you could find them in California. So I wanted to see it. I asked my sixth grade teacher, where can I find condors? And he said, well, Mike, you're, you're, you're a little too late. There's really very few of them left and they're about to become extinct. Well, he was right. In 1982, they were able to agree on a census and they discovered that there were just 21 wild condors left in their stronghold in Southern California, some remote mountains. There was one captive condor, so a population low of 22. That's the lowest the population ever got. And it was really an alarm call to biologists to do something. And what was done was more research to discover what were the threats that were killing these birds. And so in the 1980s, we first had radio telemetry to track birds. And these birds were actually tracked to their death. And once the birds were discovered dead, they could recover the body and find out what was happening. And this picture of poisoning became clear even in the 1980s that birds were suffering from poisoning. That was really the evidence that was needed to tip the scales in favor of capturing the remaining wild condors. It was a very controversial decision. By 1987, the last wild condor was brought into captivity with the hopes that a captive breeding program could raise enough birds to later release them back into the wild. So as the sun set on the condor population, we can look at several reasons for decline. I mentioned shooting and poisoning, lead poisoning became known as an issue. Uh, it was suspected that fragments of lead from spent ammunition was being ingested by condors as they scavenged carcasses. And there were other poisons involved too. These were unintentional. These poisons were usually directed at perceived predators of livestock. Well, condors and other scavengers would get this poison as well and they could die. And then later on, uh, it became clear that collisions and electrocutions were a problem. Collisions with power lines. Uh, nowadays, there's concern for collisions with wind turbines, but a collision with a wind turbine has yet to be documented, but something to look out for for the future. And then electrocutions, uh, birds landing on power poles or colliding with the power lines and become, becoming electrocuted. Now, all of these are man-made issues. They're fixable to some extent, 
But the condors, they have two disadvantages in their biology that don't help matters very much. All right, so what do you think? Is this a handsome bird or, or not? I think that's, uh, the adult there is, is a beautiful adult of at least six years old. And this is the point here is that they take so long to reach breeding age. They start as juveniles, very dark headed and gradually the head color gets a little bit more pink. And then you have the nice bright orange and pink of, of an adult bird there. It takes so long for these birds to pair up and start breeding that if you get mortality before six years of age, that doesn't do much for the condor population. So they have that disadvantage working against them. Another disadvantage is that once they do reach breeding age and pair up and start nesting, they don't exactly breed like rabbits. I invite you into a condor nest. This is a redwood tree cavity about 60 feet off the ground. And it's a burnt out portion where it's filled with debris, making a nice level place for a condor to lay its egg. And this nest is actually featured on our live nest cam. And if you have a chance, please go online either to our website or explore.org and you can watch the live development of a chick. I believe the chick is about five or six weeks old now. I was just checking it earlier today and it, it looks like a, it's about the size of a volleyball with very big feet. And actually, actually it's kind of cute. So uh, something to, something to look for, something to watch uh, uh, when you're looking for something online to, to watch. The condor will lay one egg, that's it. Now, most other birds will lay a lot more than that. Even eagles will produce two or three chicks. But the condors, it's just one egg. It takes a lot of energy to produce that, about the size of an avocado. It takes nearly two months for that egg to hatch. And if you start doing some math, two months for the egg to hatch, another six to eight months for the chick to fledge from the nest. And then once the chick does leave the nest, it's dependent on the parents for maybe a year or more. And so with all of that investment, the condor pair is not ready to nest again the following year. And so reproduction is very slow. And we can compare that to other birds. A turkey vulture comes to mind. Turkey vultures are a little bit smaller, a six foot wingspan. They will they'll lay two eggs. And this is a timeline here. This is a three year period and each little hash mark is one month. So you can see the turkey vultures, they're laying their two eggs early in the spring. Those eggs hatch and the vultures are ready to fledge about mid-summer. And it happens fast enough to where the adults can nest again the following year and again in year three. So after three years, a turkey vulture will produce up to six young. And as I mentioned, condors are much, much slower. They'll lay that egg earlier, February, but it takes a long time for that chick to develop. The chick is actually leaving the nest around Thanksgiving or Christmas time. And either the parents don't have the energy or the time to do another nest attempt in year two. So we're looking at year three for their next nest attempt. So just in this short period, turkey vultures can produce three times the number of chicks that a condor can. So you start thinking now that 
maybe condors might be more vulnerable than turkey vultures to the effects of lead poisoning because they're not able to replace their numbers as quickly. It's really a sustainability issue. The two disadvantages I mentioned are in red, slow maturation and few eggs. Now that's not a problem uh, if you're a condor because usually you can offset that. They live a long time. So they have many years, 60 years, in which they can produce young enough to replace themselves. In this situation, the blue naturally offsets the red and you can have a stable population. But when you introduce unnatural excessive adult mortality as another red block and it cuts into that lifespan, then you have a lot of red on the chart and that population starts to go down because you can't replace your numbers. And that's where we've been with the condor for the last 150 years or so. For, for me and Ventana Wildlife Society, it was a sobering realization that for all the progress we've made with California condors, there are actually 23 species of vultures in the world. And as a family, they're not doing well. This family is one of the most vulnerable of any bird family in existence. Of the 23 species, 12 of them are endangered. So even after working with the California condor, the Tana Wildlife Society can consider that there's a lot of work yet to be done internationally with other species of vultures, perhaps using our expertise in other arenas for conservation of other species. We can look at a couple others, the Andean condor in the upper left corner under the California condor. It's actually bigger. It lives in South America. It has a wingspan up to 10 feet. Now those two birds are the only ones that are called condor of, of these 23 vultures, but there's a lot of similarity with some of the old wor world vultures to California condors. All right, now you can't tell me that's not handsome. Well, let's see. Let's talk about the actual return of the condor because we left our story in the late 80s when all the birds were brought in from the wild and now they're all in captivity. And fortunately, the captive breeding program really took off. They did a fantastic job producing birds and also maximizing what little genetic diversity there was. And so within five years, there were enough condors to consider releasing them back into the wild. And they first started doing that, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, back in 1992. Ventana Wildlife Society got involved five years after that in 1997. Ventana Wildlife Society works with the wild population. We don't actually do the captive breeding. There are several zoos and facilities that do that work. We take the birds from them and we release them. And this is one of our recovery tasks. Now this picture here is not exactly how we release birds for the first time. We actually have a very large flight pen, uh, the, size of, of, uh, the size of a garage perhaps. And, and this is a pen where the bird can be acclimated to its surroundings and then released gradually in a soft manner and allowed to come back to feed if it needs to. Uh, this is actually a picture of a bird that was released after being treated for lead poisoning. Another task we have is monitoring the 
condors that we release, we do that with these colorful wing tags. Each condor has a number. This is 99, the great one. And it also has a radio transmitter so we can track them with radio telemetry gear. And you might think the biologist here has a very firm hand on this bird and, and she does. Uh, the condors really do not like this treatment and I guess it's good that they don't. These are wild birds, but every now and then we have to trap them to tend to the transmitter and we also take a blood sample to test for lead exposure. And so our biologist here has a firm hand on the business end of the bird. That bird would very much like to take a chunk of her skin, I'm sure. And so she has a firm hold of its beak, but yet allowing the bird to breathe through its nostrils and through its beak. Her other hand is cradling the wings against her body to prevent the bird from flapping and uh, injuring himself. This is a process that could take 10 or 15 minutes, maybe a little more, maybe a little bit less, and then the birds, if all goes well, the birds are on their way. And then another recovery task is actually managing the threats to the population. We need to identify what is hurting the birds and figure out what we can do about it. Now you'll see here that I did not put numbers next to these three recovery tasks. And while the order is important, I will say that perhaps the best order was not followed here. You might think that releasing the birds is the first step. Well, maybe it shouldn't be. Maybe the first step is actually cleaning up the environment of all the bad things that made the bird threatened and in danger to begin with. Maybe it's good to fix that first and then release the birds. Well, the condor program was a little bit in a state of emer an emergency where you have all the birds in captivity and there was a strong desire to release those birds back into the wild while they still had that knowledge, while they still had that primal wild knowledge. We didn't want the condors to forget how to be condors. And so that step of fixing the environmental issues uh, had to be really sort of lengthened out and put in a different order. Now, Ventana Wildlife Society did work recovering bald eagles. And that process was much smoother because the threats that made the bald eagle in danger to begin with was fixed. DDT was outlawed and the environment became a cleaner home for those birds. And we actually saw success recovering a breeding population of bald eagles here on the Central Coast rather quickly, within 10 or 15 years. The news with the condors is good, but it's taken us much longer to achieve success. And quite frankly, we're not there yet. And that's simply because we're still managing the population threats. Here's a map of our release sites where you see that the Fish and Wildlife Service site was started in 1992. That was to release birds back in the former stronghold of the condors, those remote hills in Southern California. That seemed a very logical choice of where to put the birds, back in the same place where you took them five years earlier. Well, you also think back to those observations from the Spanish explorer, from Lewis and Clark, those that watched condors feed on marine mammal carcasses. You start thinking maybe a coastal environment is a good place to release birds as well. 
And so that's how Ventana Wildlife Society got involved. We had a property along the coast. We had just finished releasing bald eagles. We had the facilities. And so we became a collaborator of Fish and Wildlife Service here on the Central Coast. Years later, National Park Service became involved and we work in close contact with them monitoring and managing the Central Coast population. Peregrine Fund was a, an early uh, uh, partner in Arizona. That population is spread into neighboring states. And then there's a nice population down in Baja, California. Put some numbers to this map. The 2020 global wild population sits at 337 birds. That's outstanding. Uh, that's much better than the 22 birds we were left with when I was in sixth grade. And we see that the population in Central California just hit 100. And there are about that many in Southern California and Arizona. Now I put a red line between the Central California population and the Southern California population. That's because those populations are still disjunct. We do have birds monitoring or wandering back and forth very rarely, but those populations are yet to merge completely together. So in the future, we expect that merging to take place and it'll be a lot harder to distinguish between a central and a Southern California population. And I'll also add that another release site is about to be added. Where will this be? This will be at Redwood National Park in Northern California. And so that's another coastal site that will serve as a host for a condor population. Look for that in the next year or two to really get going. Now, part of the way we can monitor birds is not just through radio telemetry. For almost half of the flock, we're able to put GPS transmitters on their, on their wing tags. And the GPS is pretty sophisticated. It runs by solar power. So they're collecting location fixes, these birds are, at least uh, up to once a minute. And so that data, once they fly near a cell phone tower, that data gets transferred to where I can sit in my office and review flight paths of the condors. It's really fantastic. The detail on these data with locations every minute, you can really chart flight paths. And this data can help us locate areas where condors might be feeding and being exposed to lead poisoning. It can tell us what power lines might be at risk of a condor collision. It might tell us of other dangers like wind turbines that condors might encounter on the landscape. So they're very useful. Now, over the years of using these GPS transmitters, we've collected more than 10 million lines of data. Now, I don't know the kind of data sets that Christy runs in her office at the Conservancy, but I'm not sure she has a data set with 10 million lines of data. It's a lot. And so when you, when you project all of the points onto a map, you just get a big mess. And so what I've done here is I've made it a heat map. And you can consider those darker red areas as areas of greater densities of condor locations. And so we can see that condors are very frequent along the Big Sur coast and also at Pinnacles National Park, quite frequent east of King City less frequent in the center of the Salinas Valley, and then not at all in the cities of Salinas and Monterey. These birds are really sticking to the hills 
where they get the nice updrafts to sustain their flight. And I've included the Santa Lucia Preserve in yellow. And so you can see that the condor distribution on the central coast does include the preserve. It's on the edge of where we typically see birds, and it's a little more inland than where we typically see birds. But yet, if you're asking yourself, is it possible that I may have seen a condor near my home on the preserve? The answer is yes, it is possible. And Christy has shared observations from the Conservancy staff of condor observations, not many of them, they're still very infrequent, but they occur on the preserve probably more often than we realize. Let's look a little more closely at the preserve. Here I've indicated a couple of landmarks in red, the gatehouse and the hacienda. And then in green are a couple of uh, other landmarks, natural landmarks, uh, Williams Canyon and, and a few other peaks on the eastern side. And there's not a lot of gradient here. You might consider that condors are a little more frequent around the western edge, Williams Canyon. When I was looking at GPS data for the Conservancy, I was finding that birds were more likely to circle and soar over the Williams Canyon border. And then they would make that streamlined flight over the Hacienda and exit the preserve either at Black Mountain or Long Ridge. And those direct flights would have fewer GPS locations attached to them because they're not circling in one place. And so it doesn't show up here as dark as the areas to the west. But they've also been found at places like Vasquez Knob and Pinon Peak. And really anywhere on the preserve is potential habitat for condors. Now there's one other landmark on here that I haven't mentioned, the Palo Corona feeding site. What's this? Uh, back in 2015, we started a supplemental feeding site on Palo Corona, not very far from the preserve's western boundary. Uh, what's a feeding site? Well, it's a place where we would deliver a carcass and we'd get stillborn calf carcasses donated to us from the Moon Glow Dairy up the coast. And so we would stake those carcasses periodically to the feeding site and the condors would be allowed to feed on them. We did this not because condors are having trouble finding food. They're not, in my opinion. They don't need the supplemental food necessarily. The reason we do that is to present at least a source of known non-contaminated, lead-free carcass available for them. We want to increase their options of clean foraging, trying to buy some time while the lead threat diminishes. And so operating these supplemental feeding sites is something that we do typically further down the coast. But in 2015, we set up a site here. And it seems pretty clear that the feeding sites do a lot to influence condor distribution. And so in 2015, condors were actually at their peak in terms of visitation to the Santa Lucia Preserve. Likely, they were flying over the preserve on their way in and out of this feeding site or just in the process of hanging around the area. One of the birds that spent a lot of time at the preserve during this time was condor number 477. This is a bird that has a very celebrated history 
It was hatched in 2008 in a redwood tree south of the preserve, but in a very remote place. And this bird was in the path of the 2008 Basin Complex fire. And in fact, the fire converted its entire nesting area to a field of ash. The tree trunks survived, but we didn't give much hope of chick number 477 being alive until we visited after the fire, climbed up to the nest, peeked inside, and there was 477 covered in ash, but very much alive being cared for by its parents. We named this bird Phoenix, and over the years it's become a symbol of the hope that we have for the recovery of California condors. Well, 477 back in 2015 was seven years old. And as you remember, that's getting about time to start finding a mate and start nesting. And it paired up, it, it appeared with Condor 547, a bird that had been released years ago in Pinnacles. And the pair spent quite a bit of time around the preserve. They didn't actually stay there though. Eventually, I think it was 2016, the Sobrani Spire changed our access to the Pala Corona feeding site so much that we were not able to access it and continue feeding there. Perhaps because of that, things changed as far as condor visitation on the preserve. 477 and 547, instead of selecting a nest nesting territory near the preserve or on the preserve, they moved back south and they set up their nesting territory uh, closer to Big Sur. Back in 2018, that pair produced their first chick. We can look at some milestones for the population. Things have gone pretty well. Early on, we could see that condors were recovering their natural heritage of foraging on marine mammal carcasses. And that was great to see. In 2006, we had our first nesting attempt for the wild population on the Central Coast. The first successful one was in 2007. In 2008, we had legislation requiring the use of non-lead ammunition in the condor range for taking wildlife. And so right away, this gave us great promise for reducing the amount of lead in the environment. 2020, the population has hit 100. So there are a lot of great reasons to be excited and optimistic about this growing California condor population here on the Central Coast. And the community for the most part is embracing the condor population. Businesses on the Central Coast have adopted the condor logo. We've seen it on the state corridor. corridor uh, the Los Angeles Clippers basketball team, they, they introduced Chuck the condor. I'm not sure the fans really embraced Chuck until Chuck showed how he could dunk a basketball on a trampoline at halftime, and then uh, they thought he was pretty good. But a lot of enthusiasm for, for condors, and we're also seeing enthusiasm in the hunting community as well. We're seeing more and more support for condors among the very community that can do the most for the recovery of this species. Yet despite all this sustainability, that sustainability issue, it remains elusive. That is, the rate of condor productivity is not matching on a consistent basis the rate of condor mortality. We still have more work to do. 
And so we go back to our recovery task. And that is deal with the greatest threat to the recovery of the species, lead poisoning. I'm in my 12th year with Ventana Wildlife Society. I'm a biologist. I didn't know very much about hunting, didn't know many hunters. And it took me a long time to realize that this was not just a hunting issue. Here is a scene that we think plays out in Central California. This doesn't look as much like the coast. It might look like certain areas of the preserve, except for the, the house maybe looks a little different. This looks maybe more like something on the east side of the Salinas Valley, where the Gabalon Range rolls out into these lovely brown hills. And these private residences, the ranchers, do a lot of ground squirrel control. That is, they shoot ground squirrels. And many of the ranchers tell me that when they fire their gun, the condors actually come. Perhaps they're associating this sound with an easy meal. And ground squirrels, those carcasses do make a, a rather easy meal. It makes a little bit of sense that there might be a lead threat with this scenario, the shooter is not likely to collect the animals that he or she are shooting. Unlike a hunter that is pretty likely to collect the deer that, that she shoots. So the lead, if there are fragments, are left in these animals and they can be ingested by condors and other scavengers. And so Ventana Wildlife Society wanted to reach out to hunters and ranchers as well. Ranchers particularly because we know that they do so much for wildlife conservation on their land. They're preventing it from being developed. Condors visit their land for food. They visit their land for water. And so it's a very good thing for condors as long as the condors are not finding lead in the carcasses that they're, that they're ingesting. So we're trying to reduce lead exposure. And this photo here is actually our biologist and actually a, a non-biologist handling a condor, conducting a lead test to determine the level of lead in this bird's blood. It's a test that is done periodically for all the birds in the flock. And if you were to guess which one of these people have, has the most important job, you might, uh, you might consider the gentleman on the right. He has the, the head and he's also providing a wet cloth on the neck to cool the bird and allow the bird a little bit more comfort during this rather arduous process. So this is a team of three holding the birds. I, I kind of like it this way. We have some very, uh, very good experienced condor handlers on our condor crew who can just do it by themselves. But uh, when I line up in that situation, I like to have a couple of, couple of friends with me. On the bottom of the screen, you can see a couple of the things that we're doing to try to reduce lead exposure for condors. As I mentioned, we're providing the clean supplemental food. We're also testing their blood, checking them and treating them if necessary when they've been exposed to lead. Now, these are effective ways to help the birds, but it really doesn't do much for reducing the amount of lead that's in the environment. <coughs> and so for that, we need to actually do some non-lead ammunition outreach. And here, it's not just Ventana Wildlife Society. All of the condor recovery partners are involved 
with this very important aspect of recovery. We have individuals on staff with National Park Service, uh, Institute for Wildlife Studies, Fish and Wildlife Service, whose job it is to actually interact with hunters, tell them about the quality of non-lead ammunition, help them find products to make the switch to non-lead ammunition, answer their questions, and show that condor supporters can also be hunters to lead them in their path towards recovering the species. Now, where does Ventana Wildlife Society fit in this? Well, we're one of those partners and we've started a program, well, that was back in 2012, where we offer free non-lead ammunition to hunters and ranchers. Now, this is a project that landed on my desk. We raised some money to purchase the non-lead ammunition. And this is money that we receive from grants. It's not money that uh, we, we use from our members unless they specifically ask us to, uh, to use their donations for, for non-lead ammunition. We use grant funded uh, programs so we raised uh, some money, about $50,000 back in 2012. And my job was to buy non-lead ammunition and distribute it to hunters and ranchers. Well, great. I, the problem is I didn't really know that many hunters and ranchers. So I needed to get the word out. And so I had, we had the brilliant idea of just advertising in the newspaper and just see what the demand is. And that advertisement reached several of the local papers. It also reached the San Jose Mercury News. And within 48 hours, I spent all of my money. It was a spectacular success. And it was also a spectacular failure. We didn't necessarily get the ammunition in exactly the right places. It was really like spreading it to the wind. We didn't realize the enthusiasm and the demand among the hunting community for non-lead ammunition. So we had to be a little bit more discerning. We had to be a little smarter and more efficient with our non-lead distribution. And so here's how we went about it. Uh, this little grid here is an example of a landscape. Let's say there are 13 properties with landowners labeled A through M. And so if you were looking at that map, you might think as a priority, property J might be the place to distribute non-lead ammunition first. It looks to be the biggest property. It's right in the middle. So landowner J, she might have great influence on her neighbors. So that seems like a good place to go. And that's essentially what we did. However, we also let the birds tell us what to do. Remember, we have the satellite GPS. We know where the birds are going. We know where they're potentially feeding. And so let's look at the map. Let's see where the birds are. Here they are, property J. And uh, we find that property L, property F uh, are also pretty important. Now, I've been doing this since 2012. And over these last years, I've accumulated a database of more than 2,000 hunters and ranchers. And so I've made contacts with an increasing number of landowners on the landscape. And I can also use that database to help me determine priorities for non-lead distribution. And so let's say the properties in green are the properties with which I've had positive interactions with the landowners. And these landowners have apparently made the switch. So if birds are feeding on property J, 
I may not be as worried about their lead exposure because I know that property owner Jay, she is on board with shooting non-lead and these birds are relatively safe. In this scenario, I might look towards property E as my next priority because I have not made contact with that landowner. And so that becomes then a priority. Now this is a slow process and we have not reached all of the landowners. It's a little bit awkward for me to approach property owner C and say, hey, I'd like to give you something free. Well, they need to develop a little bit of a trust, trust for, for Ventana Wildlife Society. And so that's where developing relationships over the years really helps. And that's where the individuals who are doing non-lead outreach are very important for developing these relationships. As a non-hunter, I can come in and give the merchandise and make people happy, but we need to have that face-to-face -face contact, contact to really develop that relationship and make that change. But here's how we've done over the years since 2012. It's really varied by year. 2019 was the year of our greatest amount of distribution of non-lead. More than 3,000 boxes of non-lead distribution in 2019 alone, more than 10,000 boxes over the last eight years. Now, a good question here might be, well, Mike, didn't you say that in 2008, legislation re required the use of non-lead ammunition? It's the law now. Shouldn't they be shooting non-lead even if you're not giving it away free? Why do you still need to keep doing this? And I think the answer here is that we're working to support hunters overcome the challenges that they're facing. The law requiring non-lead ammunition has been an adjustment for them. They're learning about new products. They're trying new things. They're also trying products that are more expensive than what they're used to. The copper ammunition, it, it's a little bit more expensive. If you're shooting a couple of rounds a year at a deer, it may not add up to much. But if you're a large ranch owner shooting a thousand rounds a month or more, that cost really does add up. So this free program really is a show of support financially for this community. But it's a show of support in other ways as well. There's a challenge with availability of non-lead ammunition. This is what some of the ammunition shelves look like in the local stores. And looking at the ammunition here, uh, certainly not all of what you see here is non-lead. In fact, probably most of it is not. And so a shooter going into the store looking for non-lead ammunition may not be finding everything that they're looking for. After eight years, Ventana Wildlife Society became a licensed ammunition vendor. And that designation has helped us work much as a retailer does. We have a larger selection of non-lead ammunition, I think, than any ammo store in the state of California. So if the hunters are not finding their ammunition here in the local stores, at least we can help them get that ammunition. And lately we've had access issues as well. Gavin Newsom signed into law the, the Safety for All Act. It's the Proposition 63, really aimed at trying to make our society safer with respect to the gun laws, introducing new restrictions. And some of those restrictions have to do with ammunition. Now, 
it's no longer a possibility to purchase ammunition online and have it mailed to your home address. All ammunition sales and transfers need to be face-to-face -face with a licensed ammunition vendor, like a retail store or Ventana Wildlife Society. So it's not a simple matter of buying your ammunition online anymore. You have to go into the local store. Well, how are these how are these hunters doing during the COVID-19 crisis when all of the stores have been closed, or many of them? Access is really becoming a great issue. Another part of Pro Proposition 63, uh, the institution of background checks required. They're, they're called eligibility checks, and they're required of every sale and they cost a fee for the hunter. And so the hunter has to provide documentation that he or she did not have to provide earlier. And so new requirements that are making things a little bit more difficult for the hunters. Ventana Wildlife Society in 2019 said, let's step up the free non-lead program. Let's show a greater show of support for hunters in meeting the challenges of cost, availability, and access. And the result has been quite good. We haven't completely filled in that map of distribution. There are other la landowners that we have not uh, made contact with, and we really don't know if they're shooting non-lead or, or, or lead. It's a process, but this program has really helped soften the attitude of hunters and help them realize that Ventana Wildlife Society supports them. Hunt, Ventana Wildlife Support Society supports hunting and we're showing it by giving them free non-lead ammunition. And over the years, we've seen that shift to where the hunting and ranching community are starting to see Ventana Wildlife Society as an ally in their issues rather than uh, just another environmental organization that's trying to restrict their freedom. So I think there's a lot of reason to be, optimism, uh, to be optimistic in how Ventana Wildlife Society and the many collaborators are working together with the ranching and hunting communities to lead the way toward reducing lead exposure for California condors. But it all comes down to how the condors themselves respond. And we're trying to reach a point where the productivity increases and the mortality decreases enough to where we have our goal of a self-sustaining population. And here there's reason for hope. We're seeing evidence that there is some reduced mortality associated with lead. Certainly the legislation in 2019 expanding the non-lead requirement to the entire state of California will help continually reduce that chance of lead exposure. So we're optimistic that mortality will go down. We're already seeing productivity go up. 2020 is a record year for condor productivity. Our population of 101 birds has 20 or more nesting pairs. Now, as I mentioned, all pairs can't nest every year. So it might be 10 pairs at most per year that uh, are actively nesting. Well, this year we have a record nine chicks already in nests in 2020, and there might be more nests that we're not aware of just yet. And so things are really looking good for productivity. The result at the end of the year, we'll see. We'll see how many of these nine chicks survive and what the level of mortality is by the end of the year. 
But at the end of each year, we're trying to see how close are we becoming towards self-sustainability. And as we do better in this regard, that's when we can start thinking about backing off on some of these management actions that we're doing. So where does the Santa Lucia Preserve fit in all of this? Well, every year new condor pairs are entering the breeding population. Uh, we have a couple of new pairs this year. Next year there will be more that have reached that six year old uh, threshold. So we're going to see more pairs. The question is, where will they nest? Right now, all of the nesting is concentrated in the southern part of the central coast, um, all the way from uh, San Simeon, Big Creek, Big Sur. But there's a, there are many miles between Big Sur and the Santa Lucia Preserve and the Carmel Highlands where there is potential habitat, remember they like redwoods, there is potential habitat, but yet there are not currently nesting pairs. In time, we hope that that map will fill in with new pairs. And we hope that perhaps the San Lucia Preserve might be an important place for condor nesting in the future. And if they do nest on the preserve, and the preserve will really be very important for the continued recovery of the condor population. Uh, lastly, uh, are there not enough condors in your life? I mentioned the condor live nest cam. Please check it out. You can see our website there in yellow, but also check out explore.org. They have dozens of wildlife cams that you can really waste a lot of time enjoying. And you can interact with Ventana Wildlife Society by watching the cam and leaving your comments there on the page. And I'm trying to get to the last slide here. There it is. What can you do to help? Uh, please consider becoming a Ventana Wildlife Society member. That's part of how we fund condor recovery. In this virtual age that we're forced to delve into a little bit more, we're having monthly web chats. It's the last Thursday of every month. These are exclusive for our members and it's your chance to uh, interact with the condor field crew, ask them questions about nesting, ask them questions about uh, different condors and uh, what, what pairs are doing and uh, where to see condors, that sort of thing. So uh, that's available uh, for members. We'll also do, uh, I've also been uh, asked to do a Vultures of the World talk later in the summer, and that will be uh, a Zoom type format as well. And, and I'll go through some of the difficulties that the 23 species of vultures that you saw are going through right now. And then also, please support conservation on the preserve. Anything that Santa Lucia Conservancy is doing on the preserve is likely to benefit uh, condors. So uh, please show your support for them and the research that they're doing. They will have their finger on the pulse of what's best to do for condor conservation locally where you live. And that's all I have for now. If you have any questions, I'd love to, uh, I'd love to open up the mics and, uh, and, uh, and entertain those. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mike. That was awesome. Um, it's, it's such an incredible conservation success story. And sometimes it feels like we're always fighting to save things and, and not making as many gains as we'd like to. And so it's really important to really celebrate these huge success stories. And Monterey Bay and the Central Coast are home to multiple success stories. The, the recovery in the bay has been incredible. The condors feeding on marine um, carcasses in the last 10 years is a great indicator of that connectivity. So 
Uh, it looks like there's a couple of questions in the chat. Please Great. feel free to add some more if you guys have questions or you can unmute your mic and, uh, and jump in when there's a, a pause if, if that is uh, easier than typing something out. Um, but uh, Mike, you can see the chat, I presume. Um, I'm looking for it here. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Uh, if you down at the bottom. Okay, I see it here. Uh, there you go. Um, presumably the birds prefer high altitudes, so will the preserve be too low? I think the uh, altitude may be less important than the habitat and the terrain. They certainly like those uh, hills where they can really catch those ocean breezes that lift them up. And so anything that sustains flight can be very good. And I think the preserve has some of those features to where birds can really cruise over the preserve quite easily. At least the flights that I analyzed on GPS seem to be very direct and uh, very quick. And, and so these are birds that uh, probably aren't flapping very much. They're just catching those uh, those thermals and and uh, and working those. Turkey vultures are very common on the preserve, and so I think there's really potential for for condors to be there as well. We already know that they they do visit the preserve. The data has indicated that they are occasionally feeding on the preserve, and data has shown that some condors have spent the night roosting on the preserve. And so I think there is potential there uh, to fill in that upper half of the Central Coast. Thank you. I love the comment about the minor league hockey team in Bakersfield. Yeah, you, if you ever go to YouTube and see the video of them trying to bring out the Andean condor to show the crowd during the intermission, or I guess maybe the, the pregame festivities, um, Boy, uh, not a good move on their part. Uh, that condor got loose on the ice and uh, nobody wanted a piece of that. Uh, how do condors get along with other birds like vultures? It's a very interesting relationship. There, there is a hierarchy among condors and a hierarchy among species. Uh, condors, they rely on their sight to really identify and find carcasses to feed on. Vultures have a much greater sense of smell so that vultures can use that to their advantage to finding carcasses. So do you think condors might use turkey vultures to help them find food? You betcha. So in that respect, they're, they're partners. Now vultures will yield to condors at a feeding uh, situation. Uh, but vultures will often rely on the condors to break through the skin of a carcass because the condors have a stronger uh, beak. And so they can work together in many ways to uh, sustain their lives. And so generally they tolerate one another and at times use one another. Now, if you bring uh, golden eagles into the mix, that's a different story. Condors will defer to golden eagles, and uh, condors don't like to, to mess with eagles very much. And uh, another question, what is a healthy uh, number of nesting pairs in California? That's a really good question that I don't know the answer to. Uh, we're, we're at 20 nesting pairs now, and there are there could be a situation where nesting territories might be a little too close to one another. Um, this supplemental feeding that we do, remember that that influences the dynamics too, where the nesting territories tend to be closer to where we provide the food. So we're sort of unintentionally modifying that nesting density somewhat there's a lot of room now for them to spread out. And we think that will happen as time goes on and as we gradually withdraw this supplemental food. I can't put a number on it. The, the condor recovery plan suggests 
three populations of 150 birds. We're at 100, so we're well on that path, but the, the number that we're most interested in is the productivity versus the mortality. Do those balance each other out? So we're looking at self-sustainability, and I don't know whether that nesting pair number is 20, 30, more, less. We really need to see that self-sustainability to determine what really is healthy. And I'll just add that we don't have a lot of historic information on nesting density to help us out here. We don't know what is the golden rule here because condors in our lifetime have always been a very rare species. So that's just a long-winded way, uh, Robert, of, of saying that I don't know the answer to the, the question. Thank you. That's a good, good, uh, a good non-answer answer. <laughs> a good try anyway. Uh, let's see what else we have here. What distances do they normally travel uh, during a, a day? It's a lot of fun to look at the GPS map and you know it varies by season when when the number of daylight hours are short in the winter time they don't have much time to travel so they tend to stick pretty close to their home base and visitation on the santa lucia preserve will likewise be less in the winter time than in the summertime because condors are just not traveling as much as they do but distances let me give you a couple of examples. We've had birds on the GPS show up in Alameda County. So they can take a day trip from uh, Monterey, San Benito County, fly up the Gabalon Range and get into the Diablos and travel up in, through Santa Clara County. They don't do that a lot, but in, in a single day, they can travel over 100 miles very easily. Uh, just today, I was doing a project for, uh, for, for a client and who wanted to know what 477 was up to uh, on one of his travels. And we found out that this bird actually went to Southern California one day back in 2015. And that was during a period of time when this bird was a subadult and subadult birds tend to travel more than the home the home body uh, adult birds. And so a trip to Ventura County is not a big deal for a California condor. A curiosity, what is your birding life list number? Assuming you keep track. Well, I just got back, uh, just got back. I went to India over the winter and I got back just in time before the COVID crisis. And I had the pleasure of seeing a couple of those 23 species of vultures. And so that was a great thrill to me, seeing a couple of vultures whose populations have declined by no, more than 95% in the last couple of decades. Um, my birding life list number, I don't have an exact, but it is just below 2,000. That's, that's for the world here in North America, um, still trying to get to 600. Do condors have any known natural predators? Uh, Dana, uh, yes, they, they do. Really not much will mess with a condor, with a condor but condors have fallen prey to large terrestrial mammals, um, when they're feeding, certainly they are, in, they are vulnerable. That's why it's nice to have other birds there with you, whether it's a turkey vulture or other condors, other birds to help you keep watch. And so uh, they're usually able to handle other predators. The biggest concern I think is early on for the eggs, and the young nestlings in the nest. So if you're, if you're watching on the live nest cam, uh, you might find some concern for 
uh, golden eagles. Uh, ravens uh, could take condor eggs. And so these bird species can really uh, be pests for, uh, for condors. Do vultures and condors kill to eat or are they both carry in feeders on other kills? Uh, vultures and condors are almost exclusive scavengers. They will not generally kill something. So consider that they will really only eat something that is already dead. That's an excellent question. That's not to say that condors have not finished off an animal that was in the process of dying. One of our biologists, the, the great Mike Tyner, who, who passed away in, in 2011, he observed a condor attacking a sea lion pup uh, on the Big Sur coast and actually watched the condor kill the pup and, and eat it. We think this is a situation where the pup was not doing very well to begin with. Uh, it was injured, it was abandoned, and likely to die. The condors uh, sort of finished off that process, but consider them to be obligate scavengers. Okay, I think I've gone through, I think I've gone through the chat. Yeah, so any, any last questions out there? Feel free to throw them up on chat. Um, and uh, I can throw I can throw out one more uh, activity if uh, if you don't have enough condors in your life consider uh, checking out the uh, profiles on our website. You know, uh, this is the the social media era where all condors have to have their own bios, and so you can get to know each of the condors. And if you watch the condor cam, you might actually see. Uh, condors with number tags and you can learn to identify them and, and find out information uh, on these birds. And when you find out information on the individual birds, you'll find out that they have all different personalities and all different situations. You'll find that some are monogamous pairs and you'll find out that there's the occasional threesome mating strategy for, for birds where condors will nest not in pairs, but as three birds. So a lot of interesting things you can learn just by checking out the condor bios on our webpage. Awesome. Mike, I've got one more, uh, well actually two more questions for you. Oh, we got a, another question. Um, yeah, let me, let me answer this one. Do the pairs mate for life? The answer is yes. They're they're largely monogamous, but, but there, there's a lot that goes on. And so uh, birds can repair if their mate has died or become uh, uh, lost or, or, or whatnot. So, so it, it does change, but I would consider them monogamous. And then they have that, uh, that uh, chance that they might be a, a threesome, which we don't know if it's uh, natural or not, uh, there's certainly some advantages based on the biology where if you have a third bird, you might be able to nest every year if that third bird is a second female. And so there are some advantages to uh, nesting in small groups like that. And I will also mention uh, uh, 477, that bird that I talked about, Phoenix, he must have been so excited to nest for the first time in 2018. Chose a redwood tree, much like the tree that it was born in, and produced a chick of its own. But DNA analysis later found that 477's chick was not actually his. Another bird, 209, came in and turned out to be the father. And so we have some extra pair issues going on as well, and uh, a lot to learn on that. But again, another long-winded uh, narrative to tell you that, yes, they do mate for life. So there's one more question, which was exactly what I was going to ask, too. So 
Um, where would you encourage people to go to try and see condors, um, presumably along the coast? There's some, there's some pretty reliable spots that you've shown us in the past. And when they are out looking for the birds, I would add, what are your tips and techniques for quickly identifying condors versus vultures when they're flying? Oh, that's good, yeah. Yeah, certainly the coast is a good place to go. Um, head a little bit south. Uh, once you hit Andrew Malera, you're, you're getting close to, to condor country. And then once the highway, highway one starts closely paralleling the coastline, that's when the condor observation chances increase because condors like to feed on the marine mammals just off the coast and the condors like the ocean breezes that give them lift. So right on Highway 1, right by the coast, is a good place to see them. Uh, where? Uh, there's a pullout. We call it Sea Lion Cove, but if, but if you go to the, if you go to the uh, Coast Gallery, there's a twin pullout just on the north side of the Coast Gallery. And that's a good place just to hang out and look for condors, either feeding on the sea lion carcasses down below on the beach, or you know, take a picnic lunch, sit on those uh, big rocks uh, at that pullout, and hope for condors to, to sail by. So that's certainly a good place to go. Julia Pfeiffer Burns State Park is a good place to go. You, you want to go there to see the waterfall anyway. And so uh, when you're looking at the waterfall, you can look back towards the entrance of the park and up on the ridge line. And that's a good place to see condors soaring. And also they roost in those big snags on the ridge line above Julia Pfeiffer Burns State Park. There's also a vista point between those two locations. It's the only one marked with a blue vista point sign there on the highway in that stretch. And that's a good place to look in both directions for condors in flight. So on a, on a condor tour, we're looking for, for birds that uh, are big, but sometimes they're just specks in the sky because they're so far away. And when that happens, you can't see their wing tags. You can't see the big white triangles underneath their wings. You can't see the big pink orange head. So you're really looking for some flight patterns. And with condors, they don't flap their wings very much. You just see them soar effortlessly. And turkey vultures, they tend to hold their wings in kind of a V pattern and, and they'll, they'll wobble quite a bit. But condors, straight and fluid. And their outer primary feathers, this is one that I'm holding here, they're really spread out like fingertips trying to catch every bit of, of, uh, of wind activity that they can to sustain their flight. So just that steady flight is really a tip off that you might be looking at a condor. Yeah, I should also mention Robert that uh, Pinnacles is an excellent place to go to look for condors. Oftentimes uh, a, a good hike is involved there where if you hike up to the, up the High Peaks Trail, you can often get very close observations of condors on those rocks and flying around those rocks. This is not the best time of year uh, or the best uh, time you know, period to be traveling around, but uh, certainly in the spring and, and fall and, and portions of the winter, you can, uh, you can see condors uh, at pinnacles and it's a very, very pleasant experience. All right, last question. We got one more from Alicia. Um, uh, why yeah. it takes so long for condors to find a mate? Well, uh, for one thing, I think they're, the birds are looking at, at breeding cues. And so one of the things I think that a, a condor is looking for in a mate is a nice head color, you know, a nice, a nice looking bird. And so an adult breeding condor would have a nice pink head 
and it takes them a long time to achieve that coloration. So I think that's part of it. They just don't look like mate-worthy birds for many years. That, that head color is kind of splotchy as a subadult, part pink, part black, and I, I think potential mates don't see that as being suitable, and so maybe there's not as much selection there for the younger birds. And so once they reach breeding age, maybe it doesn't take them that long uh, period. But another thing to consider with a condor population so small, even 100 birds is not very many, and if 20 of them are already mated, that leaves really very few eligible condors out there. And so it takes the combination of finding the right bird in the right location at the right time. And I can see that potentially taking a long time. Awesome, thank you so much, Mike. And thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, I hope you enjoyed this. We will be posting a link to the recorded version of this so you can share it far and wide and relive the uh, exciting information that Mike shared with us. Um, I do encourage you guys to check out Ventana Wildlife Society's website and think about joining them and becoming a supporting member because they are doing really cool work, not just on, on um, the condors, but um, on all kinds of different bird issues in our area, including working with us. So. Um, awesome. All right, Mike, anything, any last words? Thanks very much. Thanks for, for spending this uh, portion of your afternoon with me. Uh, thanks for your support. Uh, I enjoy so much working at the preserve and uh, I look forward to getting back there very soon. And I look forward to the day when we can talk more about the actual condors that we're seeing on the preserve. So Absolutely. thanks very much. Have a good evening. You too. Good night, everybody. Thank you.